Welcome to Bismarck, North Dakota. <laughs> nice wintry day, about 20 degrees out. And the wind is blowing pretty good. It reminds me of John chapter 3, where Jesus talks about being born again to Nicodemus. And he tells Nicodemus, the spirit is like the wind, it blows wherever it will. So let's open the Bible and see what it has to say. We are going to begin our study today in the book of John, chapter 3, where Jesus is talking to a man named Nicodemus. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it, whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. So what is Jesus talking about here? Being born of the water and of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. And here he compares being born of the Spirit as, as the wind. The wind blows where it wants to. You can hear it, but you can't tell where it's coming from and where it goes. And he says, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Well, think about the wind. You can see the effects of the wind. You can see it blowing the trees, blowing leaves around. You can feel it blowing through your hair against your face, but you can't really identify or physically see the wind itself. When you talk about being born of the Spirit, you don't see the Spirit in a person, but you see the effects of the Spirit on that person's life, the way they live their life, the words that come out of their mouth, the way they um, interact with people how they treat people. You notice a change in them when someone is born of the Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking about here. So, what does it mean to be born of the Spirit? Or, So let's look further into this. We're going to turn to John chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 29 through 34. Verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw, and bare record, that this is the Son of God. So here we see John, who didn't know Jesus, even though they were related, saying that God had told him to baptize with water so that he could identify Christ. And how could he identify him? When he saw the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost, indicating that it's Christ that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Let's continue on in John chapter 7 and read verses 37 through 39. 
In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But these, this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So John the Baptist identified, when he, after he baptized Christ, he saw the Spirit of God, his Father, ascend on him, that Jesus would be the one that would baptize with the Holy Ghost. But in John 7, the Apostle John says, that hasn't happened yet, because Jesus was, has not been glorified. So let's continue reading here. Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 1. And read verses 4 through 5. Verse 4. And be assembled, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not been many days hence. Here we are in Acts chapter 1. Jesus has died on the cross. He has been crucified and he has been resurrected back to life by his Father. And now he is with the disciples and he is telling them, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. And he goes on to say in verse 5, For John baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Remember, we already know that Jesus is the one that baptizes with the Spirit. And we know that he won't do that until he's been glorified. Let's continue on in Acts 1, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at that this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the time, times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, Two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Here again, Jesus has given them further instructions that they shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, that they will be witnesses for Christ both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria, Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. After he has spoken these things, Jesus is taken back into heaven. Yet they still have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let's go ahead and continue in Acts. And, uh, in Galatians chapter 3, and let's see what this promise of the Father is all about. Galatians chapter 3, starting with verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, you notice it doesn't say he's taken away the law, but he's redeemed us from the curse of the law, which is death, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, Yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereunto. Now to Abraham and a seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds, as of, as of many, 
let us go on and to thy seed, which is Christ. So this promise of the Father was told to Abraham that through him he would be a blessing to all nations and that Christ is the heir or the seed of this promise. It's not to all of Abraham's descendants, it's to Christ alone. And it's through Christ who baptizes with the Spirit that we receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, remember Christ has already gone back to heaven, and they're waiting in Jerusalem for the outpouring of the Spirit or being baptized by the Spirit. They were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Interesting, isn't it? And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. Cloven tongues. Tongues split into two at the top. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noised about abroad, the multitude came together, and they were confounded, because they heard every man speak in his own language. Continuing on further in Acts chapter 2, this is part of Peter's sermon to those that were listening to them to tell them what has happened, what, what they were seeing going on. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me f freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sculpture is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses." And therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. This is what Peter is saying. God has raised Jesus up. Jesus is now at the right hand of the throne of God, having been exalted, having been glorified, has received from his Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Christ has shed for this. Christ is baptizing them with the Spirit. And that's what explains what they now see and hear. Let's continue on to Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 11. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together onto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Remember, Jesus had told them that they would see, receive power and had them wait in Jerusalem for the outpouring of the Spirit. Verse 13. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. Remember, John, the Apostle John in John 7 said that Christ would baptize with the Spirit, but he had not done so because he had not yet been glorified by his Father. Here, Peter and John are witnessing that Christ has been glorified and has given, given them power not of their own, but of Christ, to heal this man. Verse 13, starting over again. The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, 
and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye, but ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Remember, in Galatians chapter 3, it's by faith that we receive the promise of the Spirit. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. God has sent forth the Spirit of Christ into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Now, anybody that has studied the writings of Paul know that he speaks in very, very long sentences. So we're starting in the middle of a thought here. Let's start in verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from the ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Where Unto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Paul has been called to be a minister to the dispensation of God. And here he is telling the people that the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations is now made manifest to his saints. And what is that mystery? That mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's continue with Romans chapter 8, reading verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace." Because the carnal mind is, at, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies 
by his spirit that dwells in you. Let's go back to the beginning of Romans 8. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Verse 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, who is the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, who dwells in Christ? It's his Father's Spirit, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, there's nothing wrong with the law here. It's the flesh that was weak. It's the flesh that couldn't be obedient to God's law. God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. How did he condemn sin in the flesh? Hebrews 4 says he was tempted in all ways like we were, but yet was without sin. He overcame sin. Why? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And we'll compare these two things in a little while here. So those that walk after the flesh do the things of the flesh, but they that walk after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. So how does this occur? In verse 9 it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if it be that the Spirit of God dwell in you, the Spirit of Jehovah, the Spirit of Yahweh, the Father of Christ. It goes on to say, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Remember, there's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. We can find that in John 14, 6. And we find that 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So here Paul is saying, if we don't have the Spirit of Christ, then we are none of God's. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So if we have Christ in us, he brings the presence of the Father, the Spirit of God, into our hearts and minds. Let's continue on. In John 14, starting with verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Here's Jesus speaking in verse 18. Don't miss this. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. How will Jesus not leave them comfortless? He says, I will come to you. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth. Who is the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father except by him? It's Christ. In verse 17, who do the disciples know? It's Christ. Who dwells with them? It's Jesus. And who shall be in them? It's Christ. Let's continue on. Yet in a little while, verse 19, And the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall also live. And that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Who is in us? It's Christ. And he hath, that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved in my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself to him. No one else is manifesting Christ to the disciples or those that keep his commandments. Is Christ manifesting himself to them? Jesus said unto him, Not a scary, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? The disciples knew he was talking about himself. Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You know, it's Christ brings us into the presence of the Father by the Spirit. 
He is the mediator between God and man. He doesn't just mediate us to the Father, but he also mediates the Father to us. Verse 24, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. All the words that Jesus spoke were words that his Father gave him to speak. And here he is saying, He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the words which ye hear is, is not mine, but the Father which sent me. Let's continue on in uh, John 17, starting with verse 17. And I, I encourage you to read all around these scriptures that we've read. I've, I've really condensed things here a lot. Verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Jesus is praying to his Father, and he's praying for his disciples. Neither pray I these neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in them, in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, this is Christ speaking, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So let's talk a little bit more about the this, this Spirit. What is the Spirit? What is it talking about? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 9 through 12. Verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the thing which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed to them to unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yet the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Notice verse 11. What man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? I have a spirit, you have a spirit. But no one knows what we're thinking except our spirit. We don't have a separate being that is part of us that is called a spirit. It's the same with God. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. The spirit of God, the spirit of the Father, the spirit of Jehovah or Yahweh, whatever name you so desire to call God, is not a separate being. It's his mind. It's his character. No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And as we have read, the only way we have access to the Spirit of God is by receiving the Spirit of Christ in us. Let's continue on. Galatians 2, 16 through 20. So what difference does it make? I told you earlier we're going to pair, compare walking in the flesh to walking in the Spirit. So this is going to tell us what difference it makes. This is where we're going to see the evidence of the Spirit being in someone. Just as we see the evidence of the wind affecting the surroundings around us. Starting with verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. 
Notice it's not saying the faith in Jesus Christ, but the faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus accomplished everything on this earth according to the plan of salvation because of his faith and trust and complete dependence upon his Father. He only spoke the words that his Father uh, told him to speak. It was the Spirit of God living in Christ that performed the miracles that he performed. It was the faith of Christ that allowed him to go through the, the experience of crucifixion on the cross. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus said, not my will be done, but yours. You know, he said, if possible, please take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. It was the faith of Jesus that brought about this promise of the Spirit. And not by works of the law, verse 16, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, well, we seek to be justified by Christ, we also are we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's because of the faith of Jesus that we have the promise of the Spirit. And so let's see what this causes to happen in our life. Let's see the evidence of the Spirit in us and how that is revealed. Verse 16 of Galatians 5. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of, which, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the past time, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So has the law of God been done away with? Obviously not, because all these things are against the law of God. But in verse 18, it says, if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What is that talking about? Well, let's continue on and see. But the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit living in your life, the evidence of Christ in you, the hope of glory, who brings in the presence of the Father by the Spirit, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So when we see here in verse 18, if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why is he saying that? In verse 22 and 23, we see the fruit of the Spirit, the results of the Spirit living in you, the Spirit of Christ who brings the Spirit of this Father into our lives. Against such... There is no law. There's no law against doing those things. So thus you're not under the law if you're in the Spirit. You're not under the, you don't come under the penalty of the law, of disobedience of the law, because you're not disobeying God. So when we look at this account of Jesus' interaction with Nicodemus, and he tells Nicodemus, 
You can see the wind and the results of the wind, but you don't know where the wind comes from or where it goes. And so are those that are born of the Spirit. You can see the results of having the Spirit of Christ in you, which brings the Spirit of the Father with him, but you can't see them. You can only see how they affect one's lives, how they change one's life, how they change the way they live their life, how they treat people, the words that come out of their mouth, the actions that they perform. And when they do those things of the fruit of the Spirit, they are not breaking the law of God because there is no law against doing those things. I hope that you have gained some insight about the story of salvation through Christ, how the gospel of Jesus Christ works in our lives, and the difference that it can make. May God continue to bless you as you study his word.